When we were young, we often heard from our parents to study math so we could count our change right when shopping. With credit cards, however, fewer and fewer people have to worry about change. The pandemic became one of the things that further accelerated this transition. According to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, non-cash payments were made by 90% of customers as of June 2021. Today, every child knows what a bank card looks like, but not every adult knows how it works. To begin with, your money is kept in your bank account, with your card being a key to it. Any operations that change the status of your finances, for example, buying food at the grocery store, are called transactions, and this is how they work. First, the terminal captures the data from your card and transmits it to the issuing bank. Then, the information is transferred to the international payment system, and from there, back to the bank. Finally, a response message is received indicating whether the transaction is approved or declined, and it all takes just seconds. That said, this process is not always quick and convenient, but first things first. Edward Bellamy was the first to come up with the idea of a credit card in his novel, Looking Backward, published in 1888. Yet the first payment cards didn't appear until 1920. They were made of cardboard and wore out fast. They were presented when making a purchase in a store, cafe, or gas station to help identify its owner and confirm their capacity to pay. Naturally, those cards were not integrated into any centralized database, and today they would call them loyalty cards. Back then, they were made of non-durable materials, so they quickly became unusable. A major upgrade took place in 1928 when the Boston company Farrington Manufacturing created the prototype of a metal loyalty card, charge plate which was quickly adopted by retailers. The names and other details of the card owners were embossed on them. The cashier would take the card from the customer and put it in the imprinter. A charge slip was placed on top of it, against which an inked ribbon was pressed. One of the slips was given to the customer, and the other was kept by the store clerk, who took it to the bank, where the sum was taken from the buyer's account. The process facilitated the interaction between the store and the customer by significantly speeding up the bookkeeping. The history of Visa begins in 1958, when Bank of America, the largest U.S. bank, issued the Bank AmeriCard credit card. To promote the new product, the bank sent its cards to a number of clients, and before long, 60,000 Fresno households had a Bank AmeriCard. The credit card limit was $500, equivalent to over $4,000 today. Under these circumstances, even the most frugal of clients couldn't resist the urge to spend money. Soon, people flooded the stores. A few months later, the bank reached the point when it could no longer process the ever-growing number of charge slips that kept piling up. Without today's technologies, the bank was forced to rent a whole gymnasium just to store the incoming documents. Soon, word got around about it, and cardholders decided to take advantage of the chaos. Every fifth started missing their credit card payment. By the end of 1959, the credit card delinquency rate was 22%. The bank sustained losses of 20 million, and the total amount of goods purchased by cardholders was 60 million. Joe Williams, who came up with the idea of credit cards, was fired after the project failed. But the idea lived on, and different states continued sending cards to their clients. Soon, the hard work and good advertising paid off. In 1961, AmeriCard at long last made a profit. In 1963, in California, the total number of transactions using AmeriCard exceeded 111 million. Competitors were losing their skepticism, the project that was destined to fail now seemed to have promising prospects. Other banks considered launching their own cards. Between 1965 and 1966, Bank of America entered into a series of agreements with different banks outside of California, giving them the right to issue Bank AmeriCard. Not everyone was ready to settle for that. Several banks united to create the Master Charge Association. That would later become MasterCard, the biggest rival to Visa. In 1968, the leaders of Bank of America and the largest license holder banks met in Columbus, Ohio, to address problems concerning the card system. It was then that the future father of Visa started his path. The now legendary D. Hawk was then nothing more than an assistant to the vice president of a small bank in Seattle. He had odd ideas that people didn't see as viable, 
But it was those ideas that led to the international success of Visa. Hawk represented the National Bank of Commerce in Seattle, where he had worked since 1965. At the meeting, he proposed to set up a committee that would consider the problems at hand and offered to head the committee himself. He said that separating AmeriCard from Bank of America must be the first step to overcome the crisis. For the next year, Hawk's proposals were shelved at endless meetings and conferences. However, at the end of 1968, a large meeting of the bank's management was held in Sausalito at the headquarters of Bank of America. D. Ward Hawk and his team were taking part in it, but among others, there were also Ken Larkin, the head of Bank of America, who was a strong opponent of Hawk. The meeting ended in a big scandal. Once Hawk was done with his speech, Larkin jumped up from his seat and in the most colorful words, said that there was no separating the card from the bank that created this card system, invested an awful lot of effort and money in it, and owned 40% of it. He rushed out of the hall, leaving everyone shocked. His skepticism towards the idea was also fueled by the contempt Larkin had for Hawk. For a month, there was no news from the bank's management. Hawk didn't know what to do and was about to give up when Jack Dillon came into the picture. He also took part in the Suasilito meeting, and now he was going to reconcile the two parties. He made Larkin agree to a compromise, and soon Hawk was notified that a new independent company was going to be created. That said, Bank of America was to receive 40% of the seats in the company's management. AmeriCard would be transformed into a jointly controlled consortium, and Bank of America would not give up ownership and control of the credit card licensing program for a period of five years. After the top management was formed, the board of directors had as many as five representatives of Bank of America, as well as one representative from each of the other issuing banks. Within a year, Hawk and his team centralized the payment system, making it more streamlined. In the early 1970s, the U.S. banks lost almost $300 million from the card business. At the time, D. Ward Hawk chaired the board of directors of a new corporation called National Bank AmeriCard, Inc. Two years later, the banks ran a surplus and 15 countries obtained a license to issue Bank AmeriCard. In 1976, banks outside the U.S. started showing resentment towards the fact that cards they issued had Bank AmeriCard written on them and not least because of the Vietnam War that had affected the United States' reputation. To address the growing discontent, NBI renamed Bank AmeriCard to Visa and the National Bank AmeriCard company itself to Visa USA. This change significantly increased clients' loyalty. 2011 became a milestone for the company. Visa Europe and Wireless Dynamics announced the development of iCard a new contactless payment system device for iPhones. It relied on an antenna and an embedded secure element where the Visa mobile card was stored. In 2014, iPhone 6 users could finally pay with their device. To do that, you needed to install a special application from Apple Pay that allowed you to tap your device to pay without entering your PIN. The same technology is used today. In 2021, the estimated worth of the Visa brand reached $186 billion, making it the fifth most valuable in the world. D. Hawk, who the brand owes its success to, never considered himself a businessman. Instead, he called himself a philosopher and literature. With his brainchild up and running, Hawk left it and moved to his villa in North Carolina to read and tend to his 80-hectare garden. By then, he was 55 years old. He lived a quiet life away from the world and surrounded by nature. A few years later, D. Hawk published a book about the Visa network. He aptly described his creation as chaotic, a blend of chaos and order. The system that he developed is chaotic indeed. It's autonomous, adaptive, and self-reliant. Its unique history is included in all textbooks for financial and market experts. And it proves that if you want to make a difference in today's world, you've got to be bold enough to swim against the tide.